We're in the midst of a great struggle about whether Australia should encourage and do its fair share in an effective global effort to reduce the dangers of climate change. It's a struggle over policy between special interests and the national interest. There is no reason why carbon pricing should be a matter of partisan political division in Australia. In much of the world, perhaps everywhere except Australia and the United States, concern for global warming is a conservative as much as a social democratic issue. It has been suggested by a couple of people that my work uh, became politically partisan when on one occasion I used the term ignorant to describe some reported views of an opposition political figure. <laughs> uh, thankfully, those views had been repudiated by their author by the time of my comments and I was happy to make it clear that my description was not applicable to the updated views. <laughs> Regrettably, I have concluded that the case for Australia taking firm action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions within a global effort have been strengthened by the advance of scientific knowledge since the original review. Regrettably, because it would have been very nice uh, if uh, further scientific ev evidence had suggested that uh, uh, the earlier conclusions from the science had been overdrawn. Unfortunately, the opposite is the case. My views on the fundamentals have not shifted since I was contributing bipartisan ideas to a bipartisan challenge less than three years ago. It may appear non-partisan for some people to change their views on fundamental <coughs> questions of science and economic policy when the leader of the opposition changes party policy. That is not how I look at it. I see the exercise of independent judgment as requiring good information and sound logic to dictate the conclusions of our policy independently of change in the political firmament. It is now a while since any but the fringe dwellers of Australian public policy debate have denied that there is a warming trend, nor is there now much serious denial that there is substantial human contribution to that trend. The excellent Productivity Commission report has settled the question of whether other countries are taking action to reduce the risks of dangerous climate change. The Productivity Commission report has also played a significant role in what is now a decisive victory for carbon pricing over regulatory interve intervention in the battle of ideas. Carbon pricing happens to be the low cost way of meeting national targets. But if some countries want to shoot themselves in the foot by doing things in an expensive way, they are free to do so. You can do things that are expensive, but that do little to reduce emissions. If you count the cost of a program as, as the measure of your effort, then it might put us up fairly high in terms of effort, <coughs> but in terms of the actual effect on emissions, it is fairly low. Photovoltaic electricity has a great future, for, uh, but policies we have used to promote it in Australia have exceptionally high costs. The price will be the world price after we move to trade and entitlements with international linking. Uh, under my recommendation, we'll have a fixed price for three years and we'll then uh, have a market-based price linked to international prices. Well, a few words on the scheme. Uh, I've suggested that a carbon pricing scheme started in 2012 uh, uh, should initially have a fixed price. Um, and I've recommended a starting price uh, between $20 and $30 and uh, for in the absence of compelling reasons to move away from it, I would focus on the middle of that range. Uh, that would uh, put us more or less in line with current international prices at the current strong exchange rate. Uh, if the scheme were at this midpoint, around $25, $26, it would raise a large amount of money, around $11 billion in its first year. I have suggested that a bit over half of that uh, be passed back to households uh, as uh, tax cuts <coughs> and social security adjustments. And if they're well uh, designed, uh, then they can have a positive effect on labour force participation, additional economic benefits. I've suggested that about 30% uh, of the revenue should go initially 
uh, to support for trade exposed emissions intensive industries uh, for the first three years. Uh, uh, and in that first three years, um, uh, I'm not suggesting a large change from the proposal that was within the government's uh, old carbon pollution reduction scheme. Uh, on average, uh, I think that that uh, overcompensates uh, many industries. It may undercompensate some. Uh, and so I'm suggesting that after three years we go to a disciplined approach in which an independent institution like the Productivity Commission uh, apply uh, rigorously uh, clear principles uh, that uh, secure Australia's national economic interests. I'm suggesting that substantial amounts of the revenue from carbon pricing should go uh, to uh, uh, support for innovation. I've suggested that substantial funds be allocated for fire sequestration in the land sector. All Australians want to know where the new jobs and incomes will come from in a low carbon economy. Uh, the question is related to another one, where will we find the, the reductions in emissions that meet increasingly ambitious targets? Questions about where the jobs will come from were always on people's mind as we Max Gordon and, and others, uh, began to reduce protection over a quarter of a century ago. The answer that my economist colleagues and I would give at the time never sounded convincing, from everywhere. But now we know that the jobs did come from everywhere, millions of them. So what will be with the reduction of emissions under the market-based scheme I propose? The reductions in emissions will come from everywhere, and everywhere will you get new investment, new uh, uh, production to reduce emissions. There will be jobs with them. Consumers will use less energy and other goods and services that embody high levels of emissions and will spend more on other things. Natural gas exporters will try harder to find opportunities for sequestration of fugitive emissions and waste from liquefaction. Landowners will think hard about the parts of their properties that would have more value as carbon sinks than they do carrying sheep. So those parts might be a bit larger with the increase in wool prices in the last month. <laughs> Lots of people with clever ideas of doing things in ways that reduce emissions will find equity investors and lenders more interested than they were before. Every producer will think about whether it is more profitable to spend a bit to reduce emissions or to buy more permits. Millions of Australians will set to work finding cheaper ways of meeting their requirements and servicing markets. We don't know in advance what the successful ideas will be, but I'm pretty sure that there will be extraordinary developments in technology and that the change will happen faster than we expect. If we reject carbon pricing today, the climate change policy debate will still be here tomorrow, but our hopes of dealing with it in a way that preserves Australian prosperity may not.